Welcome to our worship this week for October the 25th, the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. We continue now on page one of our bulletins, or if you have a hymnal, it is 590. We'll continue by singing, O Jesus Christ, may grateful hymns be rising. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and
beloved, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. And we make this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Leviticus. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart anyone of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt of yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is found on page two in your bulletins or in our hymnals 605, What Does the Lord Require?
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Gospel of the Lord. The book of Leviticus is understandably a very misunderstood and neglected book. It is filled with rituals and regulations that appear arbitrary or flat out obtuse on the surface, but are in fact grounded in a deep ethical and moral framework. The problem is that this framework is not explicit. You have to go looking for it reading between the lines, spotting assumptions and patterns in order to piece it all together. It's part of the fun of studying Leviticus, and yes, I just used the words fun and Leviticus in the same sentence. The reading today came, comes from chapter 19, which begins with a call to holiness. We don't talk much about holiness specifically. For most of us, holiness is a vague notion, a side effect of piety or consecration or something we associate with certain individuals. But we might also describe someone as being holier than thou, and it is not a compliment. Holiness in the Hebrew law has specific meanings. It is the essential quality that defines God. God is the source of all holiness. If something other than God is holy, such as a land, the priests of ancient Israel, or a day such as the Sabbath, it is because God made it so. Nothing other than God is innately holy. Holiness is the active agency of divinity. However, holiness can be withdrawn or even compromised. The holiness of the temple grounds could be compromised by ritual impurity, causing God to withdraw from it. Only those who were holy, like the priests, or who, uh, those who had purified themselves sufficiently, could stand on holy ground or in the holy presence. Another key element of holiness was separation. That which was holy was removed from what was common or for common use. Israel as a nation had been called to holiness as part of their charter to become a separate people to God, but for a variety of reasons this had never quite worked out. Instead, there were pockets of holiness, the aforementioned Holy Land, the sanctuary and its vessels, the Sabbath day, and the priests. Thus, the problem. How can Israel as a people rise to the requisite level of holiness to become truly the people of God? Chapter 19 is part of a subsection of Leviticus that scholars today refer to as the Holiness Code, 
which attempts to address this problem. Our chapter opens with God telling the Israelites, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am, so, am holy. To Israelite ears, this must have sounded insane. What was he thinking? Who could possibly live up to an expectation like that? We tried this, remember? Previously, holiness was based largely on a standard of ritual purity that proved impossible for the nation to maintain. But this chapter lays out a very radical idea for that time, which was a path based on ritual and ethical practice by which ordinary Israelites could reach a level of holiness that before was available only to the priests. The objective was an egalitarian Israel in which the entire people could at last become a separate people of God. The call to holiness is followed by a series of laws and rituals. In fact, if you look at the rest of the chapter carefully, you'll notice that it resembles the Decalogue. We find well-known laws against stealing, taking the name of God in vain, idolatry, also leaving some of the harvest for the poor, and so on. Others, such as the requirement to burn all the leftovers three days after a well-being offering, are more foreign to our ears. Holiness cannot abide in justice. Verses 15 through 18 concern this vital problem. Verse 15 requires equal treatment of all parties in a court of law. The rich shall not be favored because of their social status, nor the poor for their lack of it. Verse 16 extends this to the court of public opinion by forbidding gossip and slander. The verb here has the basic meaning of to sell. We might say it forbids trafficking in public falsehood and accusations, which are extremely hard to answer or refute. Verse 16 also includes an interesting phrase that reads literally as, do not stand in the blood of your neighbor. Over the centuries, rabbinic opinion has developed several interpretations for this. They teach that you are obligated to go to the aid of your neighbor, whether it be offering testimony on their behalf or rescuing them from physical danger or distress. They also teach that this verse forbids profiting from someone else's misfortune. In verse 17 and the first part of 18, we find the injunction against hating your neighbor in your heart. This isn't actually a law against a belief or feeling. It's a prohibition against taking revenge, which begins by holding a grudge. Revenge is thus an act of injustice, both because it lacks the due process of a court and compounds the original offense upon both parties. And this brings us to the last half of verse 18, the key to this section, or as I like to call it, the Chewy Center. This is the verse made famous from the parable of the Good Samaritan, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That famous parable is an extended answer to the question, who is my neighbor, which even in those days was a topic of rabbinic discussion and debate. But there was another debate that has languished in the shadow of Jesus' answer, and that is about the question of what it means to love one's neighbor. The word for love in the Old Testament can refer to a feeling of attachment, caring, or affection. But rabbinic interpreters point out that you really can't legislate a feeling. Love, in this case, is a deed. The commandment to love the foreigner and the immigrant means to provide them with food and shelter. One loves God by keeping the commandments. God shows love to the Israelites by defeating her enemies. We are taught to do unto others as we would have them do to us. The Jewish sage Hillel phrased the same principle thus, that which is hateful to you, do not do unto your neighbor. But the ancient interpreters, both Jewish and Christian, are also in accord on the part of this commandment which is about loving oneself. If you do not love yourself, asked one ancient rabbi, how can you love someone else? 
The love of self spoken of here is not vanity or conceit. It is not a fragile self-esteem that must continually be defended. Instead of self-love, I prefer the term self-compassion. The founder of Hasidic Judaism, the Baal Shem Tov, explained that just as we love ourselves despite the faults we know we have, so we should love our fellows despite the faults we see in them. Self-compassion calls us to acknowledge our shortcomings, try to overcome them, but also to forgive ourselves even when we fail. It does not judge harshly, but embraces our imperfections. It allows us room for honest mistakes, but insists on, on repentance when necessary. The call to holiness proclaims that by loving ourselves and our neighbors, we can truly transform ourselves and each other as we gradually, haltingly, attempt to approximate the perfection of divine love. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together, saying words from the ancient church, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Pondering the two great commandments of the law, let us pray together, saying, O Lord of love, hear our prayer. That the church throughout the world may love you with all its heart and soul and mind, and may exemplify your love in all its life. O Lord of love, hear our prayer. That our country, in all its foreign and domestic policies, may care for immigrants, the indigent and the oppressed, all victims of economic exploitation, and all poorer and smaller nations, O Lord of love. Hear our prayer. That the leaders of the churches, with insight and fidelity, may practice love and compassion for all in need, for all who live in misery, and for all outcasts of society. O Lord of love. Hear our prayer that our community here at Good Sam may live in the faith and joy of the Holy Spirit, O Lord of love. Hear our prayer. That the wealth of our land may enable us to live in just stewardship of the earth's goods, in care for our natural resources, and in compassion for the needy, O Lord of love. 
In a moment of stillness, we lift to God the prayers of our own hearts and lives. O oh God, you care for the widow and the orphan, and you hear the cry of the poor. Listen also to our cry. Change our hearts of stone into, into hearts of flesh, with which to love you in truth, and for the sake to show compassion upon all your creatures. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Beloved, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
we pray Eucharistic Prayer A, which you'll find on page five of your worship bulletins. May this Eucharist be our food for the journey. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious God, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. 
Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, O Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We pray as our Lord Jesus taught us and prays with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper.
we pray our thanksgiving. It's on page seven in our worship booklets. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you all, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you, and touch all whom you love and pray for, this day and for all days. Amen. Our final hymn, O God, our help in ages past. If you have a hymnal, it's 680 or on page 7 in our worship books. Thank you so much for being with us online. If you would like to join us on a Sunday for our 10 o'clock in-person worship, you are very, very welcome to do so. We are limited to 30 persons in the congregation, so if you want to come, you'll need to call or email Laura in the parish office to make sure that there is a place for you on any given Sunday, but you are very, very welcome to join us. Also, if you have any practical or spiritual need, 
during the week, please do not hesitate to be in touch with me or any of um, our staff or church leaders, and we will do what we can to help and assist you. Stay well this week, and God bless you. And so let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord.